Thank you, Kathy, and uh, welcome, everyone. I hope you're having a good morning so far. Uh, excited to be kicking off the 24th Annual Animal Law Conference. And we thought we'd start it out with uh, just jump right in and uh, cover one of the most controversial and exciting topics in animal law, that of animal personhood. So we're very fortunate to have Steve Wise here, uh, the head of the Non-Human Rights Project, to talk about their work to win legal personhood. And uh, I first, I, I started getting involved in animal law specifically and ALDF in uh, the late 90s. And in 2000, Steve's book, Rattling the Cage, came out. And it was uh, the first of uh, four books that Steve would go on to write, and I'm sure there are more to come. And it was a real great entree into some of the, the, the fundamental issues within animal law and animal rights. And I saw Steve speak for the first time in 2001 at uh, the UC Berkeley Law School. And uh, he, gave, he gave a talk that was related to his work. And then after he was done, he you know, worked the crowd and, and talked to people. And I got a chance to walk up to him towards the end. And uh, I'd been reading a lot about animal law. And uh, so I asked him about some other theories in animal law. And I asked him, you know, is, is personhood really necessary for animals? And oh boy. Uh, three hours later, as security was escorting us out the door, uh, I had a pretty clear idea, um, and uh, I knew one thing for certain, and that is that uh, Steve and a non-human client of his would one day have their, their day in court, uh, just as he said. Sure enough, uh, in 2013, the Non-Human Rights Project uh, and Steve filed their first cases on behalf of uh, four chimpanzees who are being held uh, captive in New York State, actually. Um, and they are Her uh, Tommy, Hercules, Leo, and Kiko. And uh, those cases are pending, and I'll let Steve talk more about that. Uh, but Steve is the founder and president of the Non-Human Rights Project. He's the author of four groundbreaking books, as well as countless law review articles and popular articles. Um, his work is featured in the award-winning documentary, Unlocking the Cage. And Steve has also practiced animal law and animal rights law for more than 30 years and, and taught it for almost that long. Uh, and uh, he's taught at school, law schools ranging from uh, Harvard, Vermont Law School, and Lewis and Clark Law School, where he continues to, to offer classes. Uh, and in the early 1980s, uh, not a lot of people know this, but uh, Steve was actually uh, a president of the board of the Animal Legal Defense Fund, and the LDF is uh, proud to continue to, to, uh, to support the work of the Non-Human Rights Project, even as the LDF continues to work on its own strategies towards winning rights for animals. Uh, and that's really because we, we share the view that the fundamental problem for animals in our legal system is that our laws still consider them things, property. And Steve has devoted his life to solving that fundamental problem. And so please help me welcome Steve Weiss. Thank you. Thanks so much. Let's see. Does this work fine? Yes, uh, thank you for that lovely introduction, and thank you for whoever had me speak at 9 o'clock this morning. Uh, uh, at first, I didn't like it, but then they called it a keynote, so that made it all right. <laughs> so, years ago, I concluded that uh, tens of billions of animals, non-human animals in the world, were all united in this republic of suffering, that they suffer everywhere. It's universal and state boundaries don't matter and international boundaries don't matter that as you travel from country to country or state to state, you see the same sorts, same general sorts of, of suffering, pain inflicted, death inflicted upon non-human animals. And I first realized this when, when I, would, I read Peter Singer's book in 1980 now, 30, 36 years ago, and it showed it shows how much the power of the word can can change your life and i I've, I've told peter several times that uh, that indeed that reading that book did change my life and almost on a dime i i, I realized that uh, 
there was this huge problem that I really not only didn't understand or didn't know about, but, real, but that I was a part of it. And so one of the things I needed to do was to figure out how not to be a part of it, and then uh, to try to begin to figure out how to solve this, this problem of the republic of suffering that all the non-human animals are, are in. And so one of the, the earliest things that I and ALDF people in the early 1980s had to grapple with was uh, how do we begin to insert ourselves into that process and how do we begin to, to solve the problem that we're still trying to solve today. And it seemed then, and it seemed to me now, that that there are uh, at least two, two ways of doing it. One is, is the uh, welfare protection way, the other way is the rights way. And they both, they both have their pros and cons, and, uh, or, their, or they both have their, their uses. And so I recently talked about this in an article uh, for Foreign Affairs, in, or a book review, in which I reviewed Wayne Pacelli's book, A Humane Economy. And I talked about how uh, Wayne's Wayne's ideas of, of having uh, consumers harness capitalism and and use their purchasing power uh, to uh, to urge companies to to treat non-human animals better was was indeed one way of of um, pushing forward on the welfare of non-human animals and beginning to cut back on the on the amount of suffering that they they endure, but that I thought that it was a, a short-term solution, a partial solution, perhaps a medium-term solution, but that it, it wasn't a long-term solution, that the only long-term solution that I've ever been able to, to really th uh, think about is personhood, giving them rights. And the, the fundamental distinction in the, in, in the law is between uh, persons and things. And if you are a thing, you lack, <clears throat> you lack the capacity for any sort of legal right. And if you're a person, you have the capacity for, for some, some sort of, not of uh, legal rights. And so the, the struggle which I began in 1985 to th think about was how to, to deal with, with the uh, lack of personhood, with the thinghood of non-human animals. But I understood all the time that that was going to be a long-term fight and I've not been disappointed. It has been indeed a long-term fight. Uh, you know, I'm now in the 32nd year, 31st year, uh, after I began thinking about, with David Favor at the time, how we could get legal rights for non-human non animals. But because it's a long-term fight, uh, welfare litigation, welfare work, uh, Wayne's work, HSUS's work, these are all important ways of diminishing the suffering that non-human animals endure uh, in the short term, in the medium term, while the struggle, which a ALDF is involved in, which uh, Non-Human Rights Project is in in involved in, while the struggle to attain personhood, to break through this wall that I sometimes talk about that exists between uh, things and persons uh, continues to, to work its way out. And it's going to be, it's going to be a very, very long struggle. And it's going to be jurisdiction by jurisdiction. It's going to be state by state. It's going to be country by country. Uh, but there is, there's so much at, at stake. And all of legal history, to me, shows that the only way that fundamental human interests have ever been securely protected is through legal rights, through personhood. Indeed, that's why if you look at international treaties, you'll see them uh, say that, that uh, human beings have to be persons. Human beings have to have some sort of fundamental right. And that's because the legal system everywhere has decided that that's the only way you can secure a human being's fundamental interests. And I don't see any reason why that's not true for non-human animals. And you look at, at some of the problems that, that lawyers run, run into and you see them make these valiant attempts, and I've been trying to make them myself for a long time, to litigate on behalf of non-human animals who are things in our legal system. And there are so many obstacles to that. And one, for example, is standing. Uh, that the, the parties who are injured don't have any rights. And the parties who are trying to get rights for the, those injured uh, they uh, don't have any standing. 
And that's the fundamental paradox that really caused me to try to under, understand how we might be able to move towards personhood. So if you look at the recent case where Neves and other organizations tried to prevent the move of chimpanzees uh, from uh, Yerkes to England under, under the Endangered Species Act and I think other statutes too, you saw a sympathetic federal judge say, hey, I think fish and wildlife is wrong, it's violating the law, but you don't have any standing, so I'm gonna throw you out. And those chimpanzees are gonna go, and they're probably gonna go illegally, and there you see kind of in a nutshell what, what the problem is, that the folks who have the rights can't get the standing, the entities, the chimpanzees who are being injured don't have the rights. And so you have to have both rights and you, and, and you have to have injuries for standing. So rights and welfare also, I argue, come from different places. They're, they're different sorts of things. That when people file welfare, welfare litigation, which I've done for 30 years, what we're doing is we're building on a history that uh, began or almost began at the time of Martin's Act in 1821, where you have the first anti-cruelty statutes passed. And for, for the first time, you have a country who is saying that it's wrong to be cruel to non-human animals in, in some way. Up until then, it really wasn't wrong. And uh, th there, was very, uh, there was very little that, that people could do to stop non-human non animals from being treated in a cruel way, even, even in in a cruel way. So Martin's Act was a, was a very narrow act. It, it really dealt with cattle, certain kinds of cattle, but it was really the, the first time that the welfare or protection of non-human animals came into the legal system. And all of the welfare work since then really goes back to Martin's Act. On the other hand, the personhood or the, the rights part really is a continuation of the abolitionist movement which started in, in the United States in 1688 when Quakers met at Germantown to say that, to ma make a writing for the first time saying, hey, uh, human slavery is, is wrong. And goes through Lord Mansfield and the Somerset case and the Civil War and the 13th Amendment. But the, the thing I, I noticed uh, when, I, when I wrote my third book, Though the Heavens May Fall, about, this, about the famous Somerset case, was the arguments that were made both pro and con in the Somerset case are remarkably similar to the sorts of arguments that, that the Non-Human Rights Project makes and that our opponents try to make against us. If you read the book, you're, sometimes you're not sure whether the case is about a non-human a non animal or about a human slave. They're, they're remarkably similar. So, when I began to understand how to proceed, I eventually came up with what I called a, a rights pyramid, trying to, to demonstrate how it is that a, a lawyer uh, can, or can make a, an animal rights case work, or anyone can make any kind of a rights case work. So I set out this, this four-step pyramid, four-step pyramid, and at the very foundation of the pyramid is the idea of personhood. Because if you don't have personhood, then you're hoping that some other third party is gonna, has passed some sort of a statute, for example, that might protect your interests, but that you can't do anything about it if someone invades that, it, that interest and the government, for example, refuses to recognize it or doesn't want to prosecute a case on your behalf, either in a criminal court or in a civil court. So, personhood lies at, at the foundation of the rights pyramid. If you're not a person, then you are indeed invisible to civil law. So, that's the first thing that the Non-Human Rights Project thinks has to be settled, that uh, non-human animals, or at least some of them, have to be re recognized by the civil law as persons. And our litigation really is all in an attempt to, to construct the personhood for any, any sort of non-human animal. Now, after you have personhood, which is the capacity for legal rights, it's not, 
it doesn't necessarily uh, mean you have any legal rights. It's, it's the capacity. So, for example, uh, one way you can describe that is if I have, at least I have one thing here, uh, if, if, if you have a bottle of rights, these are all rights in here, you have a pitcher of rights, and you have a glass, and the glass is, is personhood. It's the capacity for rights. So if I just have a bunch of rights and I don't have anything to catch it, I just spill it all over the floor. Nobody has any rights. Personhood is the, is, is the container that holds rights. So what the Non-Human Rights Project has been doing is trying to require courts to recognize that it ha they, they have to construct a container or that the container already exists and that non-human non animals are entitled to be seen as, as persons who have the capacity for rights and therefore they have the potential for all sorts of rights. So that lies at the foundation of what the Non-Human non Rights Project is, is doing. Now once you you agree with, or the, or the courts agree that indeed a non-human animal can be a person, can be that container, then you can litigate or legislate and you begin dripping rights in one by one into that container. And if you're a lawyer, you might litigate them saying, well, what sort of rights should our chimpanzees have or an orca have or an elephant have or a dog have? And first though, you have to, it, you have to be clear that the container exists, that you're talking about, you're talking about a person. And then you begin dripping the rights in. So in our, our litigation, uh, we are simultaneously asking the courts to recognize that chimpanzees uh, are legal persons. So they're, they're the container. And we're dripping in the fun first, we're saying the fundamental right to bodily liberty that's protected by a common law writ of habeas corpus. And that has really been the, been the fight we we have been in, we started, and that we're continuing. One of many fights as the actually as the struggle begins to widen. So the the first two elements of the pyramid are personhood, and then the question of well, what rights then go into that container? The third thing, in order to to be able to able to file a lawsuit, you have to have some sort of a private right of action, uh, which in in the common law is very common. You almost always have a private right of action. Uh, say uh, you compare the, um, the Endangered Species Act at the federal level and the Animal Welfare Act. So if someone sees an animal, uh, in, an endangered species being taken, then if you have standing, you have a private right of action so you can file a lawsuit. Um, however, the Animal Welfare Act, uh, there is no private right of action. You have to go to USDA and ask them, beg them to please prosecute. And that's the difference between having a private right of action and not having a private right of action. And then if you have those three things, you have personhood, you have a certain right, you have a private right of action under that right, then the last thing is the issue of standing. And if, if you choose your non-human animal plaintiff without really thinking about it, you should have her have standing. She should be injured. Only, only a lawyer who's extremely odd will, will litigate on behalf of a non-human animal who's not being injured. So they automatically have standing. Standing doesn't become a problem in a world in which non-human animals are persons who have certain kinds of rights. It's, it's only a problem when you're litigating on behalf of non-human animals where you, the human being, uh, are not being injured. Now, the Non-Human Rights Project, I want to make sure that I don't miss too much of this. Uh, the Non-Human Rights Project then in 2013 uh, began filing its lawsuits uh, in, in the state of New York. So in 2013, the Non-Human Rights Project filed a common law, or they sought a writ, writ of habeas corpus uh, on behalf of chimpanzees. And the question is, you know, why did we do each of those things? Because after all, once we, once we started thinking about this in 1985, we're talking 28 years later. It took, it took 28 years for us to be able to figure out, first David Faber and I, and then myself, and then all of the really fine lawyers who came into the Non-Human Rights Project, how did we make those kinds of determinations? And each of those determinations uh, came after 
hundreds or sometimes thousands of hours of work and discussion. Uh, in 2013, we estimated that we had spent 30,000 hours preparing for, for, for this strategic litigation. So first of all, it was in 2013. Well, the reason why it was in 2013 is we had decided a long time ago that we were going to file suit seeking personhood for a non-human animal at the earliest time in which we thought we had some sort of a reasonable chance of success. So that meant we were going to have to think up our legal theories. We're going to have to um, wait for the legal world to begin to get used to what we were doing. So we, so there, there had to be courses taught at law schools. There had to be books written, law review articles written. Uh, there had to be animal... Um, committees set up and bar associations. It, it had to become part of the legal world, which it wasn't in 1980 and 1985. Uh, in 1990, when I began to teach at the Vermont Law School, there may have been one or two other folks who were teaching an animal law class. You know, now, I don't know how many there are. There's probably 100 or 150 animal law classes just in, in the US. And so we, we had to reach um, that point too. And then we also had to reach a, part where the, a point where the world in general, we thought, was ready to talk about this sort of thing. We didn't necessarily think that we were going to uh, win our first cases, or maybe not even our first 10 cases, or our first 20 cases. We hoped we would, but we, we, had, we understood that we had finished theorizing about all of this. And now we were ready to go. We had what we thought were really good arguments. And we needed to, to wait until the time when the legal world and the non-legal world were ready to listen. And I think 2013 uh, struck us as, as the earliest possible moment. We then filed uh, suits under the common law. Now, most animal folks, in fact, probably nobody except the Non-Human Rights Project generally uh, uh, files lawsuits under the common law. Uh, it'll be under a statute, it'll be under a constitution, uh, sometimes uh, uh, perhaps under international treaty. So we decided to use the common law. And the reason we decided to do that was because the common law is the law that is made by English-speaking judges while in the pro they're in the process of, of um, deciding their cases. So we felt that it would be easier for us to go into court and say, you judges made this law, this law, this common law, you're the ones who said that all non-human animals are legal things, that they don't have the capacity for rights. Now, you are the ones who can change it. If we file suit on behalf of a statute, say there, there's a statute or, or there's the 14th Amendment uh, and other, I don't know, I, I guess there are other uh, parts of the Constitution as well, where you have a Congress, for example, who has, or a state legislature who has put the word person in, in a statute and you go in and argue, or we go in and argue, that a non-human animal is a person within the meaning of that statute, it's inevitable that the judge is going to look at legislative history and realize that when the statute was passed, Congress, the legislatures, were not thinking about non-human animals being persons. And you can see just a harbinger of that problem with the litigation in all 50 states, for example, about whether a human fetus is a person within the meaning of that state, state's wrong, wrongful death statute. There's a lot of litigation that's been going on for a long time. The courts come down all over the place as to whether it is or whether it isn't, or a fetus becomes a person at, at this point in gestation, or this point, or this point, or it never becomes a person until, until she, she's born. So that's just a harbinger of, of, of what the problems were that we're going to face. Uh, it's more likely that, that uh, a legislature has, the, has a fetus in mind than that they, then they have a chimpanzee in mind or orca in mind or an elephant in mind. So we decided we did not want to go into a, into a courtroom and have the judge be interpreting what a third party meant when that body passed a statute or enacted a constitution. So we decided that, that the common law was indeed the way to go. Now, the common law also, unlike a statute or constitution, has a very long, long history uh, in that it's supposed to stay, stay abreast of modern attitudes, uh, changing mores, uh, changing scientific uh, facts that are, that are found. 
In other words, it's flexible. It's, it's intended to be flexible. Now, in Routing the Cage, I talked about the different sorts of common law judges and pointed out that there were there are some judges who I called formal judges, and those, those judges, when they're interpreting the common law, look backwards, and they will think that all of the law that they need in order to make their decision is in a law library on Lexis, on, on Westlaw. And so they're always looking backwards to determine uh, whether or not the case in front of them fits with, with a, some kind of a case or a pattern of cases that have already been decided. And uh, I argue that that's real, really a fool's errand in that there's no such thing as, a, as one case being on all fours with another case. Uh, that every case uh, is, is unique. That, that, every, that two cases have an infinite number of differences and an infinite number of similarities or a large number of similarities. And the question is, which of the differences and which of the similarities are going to strike the judge as being dispositive of the case? And to a very large extent, that, that question, like so many questions in law, ultimately comes down not to logic, but to values. That's why you can have a dissenting opinion, a concurring opinion, and, and a majority or plurality. It, the judges are not using different sorts of logic. They have different sorts of values that, that the um, case, the facts of the case, the law of the case are kind of being, going through like, like a sieve. And it will just strike judges as, as, as being right. Most judges believe that what they're doing is right and compelled, indeed. But I think it depends upon what, what their values are. So a formal judge thinks of law as being stability, as being certainty. That's what justice is to a, what I call a formal judge. But then the judge has to determine at what level of generality are they gonna look at prior cases and to see where they might match the present case. And that's where their value system is going to come in. Uh, and they, on, on the other hand, there are, are common law judges that I call substantive judges. And those judges don't care uh, very much, in fact, may not care at all about what the past is. What they, they, they care about either, if they're policy judges, I call them, they care about, about justice as doing what's good for society, doing what's good. Or if they're, if they're a principal judge, then, then they believe that, that, that their job is to do justice as what's morally right. So you have judges who look backwards, who say, I have to somehow follow the law, but the level of generality that they're looking at runs through their value system, uh, and it, it's hard sometimes to predict what it is they're going to, 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 to do unless you understand what their values are. <laughs> On the other side, substance of judges, you have judges who are faced with, with uh, trying to figure out what's good or what's right. And these th three major kinds of common law judges really, really account for almost all of the common law opinions. And as I tell my students, you know, what, what kind of judge are you looking for uh, when you're trying to do the sort of thing that, that we are doing? And sometimes it's, it's not really hard. As I say, as, as the Greeks used to say, the, the uh, gods punish you in two ways. They don't give you what you want, and they give you what you want. And when you're looking for the kind of judge, for example, who you think is a principal judge, who isn't gonna look backwards, you might find that that judge is, is indeed a principal judge. But the principle that judge holds is that non-human animals should not be rights bearers. And you find that you've, you've gotten what you want. You want a principal judge, not someone who's looking back at, at precedent, but the principle they hold shuts you out or the precedent they hold shuts you out, uh, or the policy that they hold shuts you out. Uh, so it's, it's, it's very complicated. But at least you have the potential of being able to make arguments to the courts that they ought to be flexible. And then you make, you make your arguments that, and that you hope are going to appeal to their values and principles. Indeed, that's what lies at the at the basis of the kinds of legal arguments that the Non-Human Rights Project uh, always makes. Uh, we do not come up with logical reasons why non-human animals should be legal persons. What we do is 
try to understand what the values and principles are of the courts in the jurisdictions in which we are appearing. And we then craft our arguments in terms of those principles and values. So we might not make the same arguments in one jurisdiction as we might make in another jurisdiction because of the fact that the, the values and principles in those jurisdictions that the judges express through their written decisions may not be the same thing. So, for example, when we looked at the state of New York, uh, one of the things that really caught our eye was, coincidentally, because we had always thought it was a good idea, and that was indeed one of the reasons we ended up chose, choosing the state of New York, um, the, is, is the way the state of New York views the writ of habeas corpus. First of all, we checked to see, and by, by the way, we looked at all 50 states, D.C., uh, Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, and 20 other English-speaking countries. So we went through 60 or 70 different jurisdictions. We actually, had a, uh, we actually constructed a standardized form of about 60 questions. So we, we ended up uh, having to uh, make three to 4,000 individual decisions based upon memos that, that uh, squadrons of lawyers and law students, thank goodness for them, were able to churn out and give us the answers so that our legal working group could shut ourselves up in a hotel in Times Square every three months and fight over how to put all of, this, all of these jurisdictions in a hierarchy. And so we, one of the things that we really liked, for example, in the state of New York was, they viewed, was the way they viewed the writ of habeas corpus, which brings me to the issue of the writ of habeas corpus. Why did we seek a common law writ of habeas corpus then in 2013. Well, the writ of habeas corpus uh, is a very interesting cause of action. It's very old, it's 800 years old, and it's evolved over a long period of time to become the thing that it, it is now. Uh, and one of the things about it is that while the common law is flexible, the writ of habeas corpus is kind of uber flexible. It's intended to be extraordinarily flexible because what's at stake in a habeas corpus, which means you have the body, is that some body, and up until we started litigating, it always been a human body, some body out there is being detained against her will. And for judges, they say, oh my God, that is about the worst, one of the worst things that we can possibly imagine is being deprived of our personal liberty. We're being detained to get to, someone is being detained against her will. And so it's a summary writ. The whole thing happens really fast. Um, and one of the really nice things about it is, is there, we believe that there was no standing requirement because we knew that we were not chimpanzees and we were going to end, and that uh, uh, we, we had rights. But the question, you know, the, the paradox that I, I, I began with we would, might go in on behalf of a chimpanzee, but, but we have the rights, but we're not going to have the standing. While the chimpanzees are, you know, have the standing because they're injured, but they don't have the rights. So how are we going to deal with that? And one of, the, one of the keys to that was to use the common law writ of habeas corpus. Because we believed, it turns out the Attorney General of New York did not agree with us, but we agreed that, or we, we, we agreed that there was no standing requirement. And why wouldn't there be a standing requirement? Well, it's because when somebody, say, uh, when, when somebody, A, detains B, they rarely let B out to go to court to seek a writ of habeas corpus. So that means in order to protect B, somebody else has to go in to court on B's behalf. And there's been some law that's been, um, that, had, that has evolved, uh, evolved around that. Um, most of it is pretty good. The, we, we don't like the federal law all, all, all that much sometimes, but, but uh, the state of New York was, you know, is, is really clear about that, as was the law of England. And so we are going to be that C. We're going to go in on behalf of B, who in this case is just like every other B, with the exception of the chimpanzee, and, uh, and I, against A. So we believe that we could go into the state of New York and we were, we're not going to have a standing problem, that we did not have to allege that we were injured by the fact that the chimpanzees uh, were, 
were being injured because they were, they were being deprived of their, of their fundamental rights of bodily liberty. And so, uh, so that's one of the reasons why we really like the state of New York. Uh, another reason why we really like the state of New York was that if you look at habeas corpus cases, they're like peons to bodily liberty. It's, there's no more wonderful thing in the state of New York than bodily liberty. And, you, you, and it's it gone on for 200 years. So we thought we were pretty clear, we, we were on safe grounds in arguing bodily liberty was uh, really important. Another thing we argued was there, there doesn't appear to be res judicata or collateral estoppel. So you can file or seek a writ of habeas corpus again and again and again, which is what we started doing. Uh, and of course, the judges can't believe this because how often does an individual judge have a common law writ of habeas corpus or a, a writ of habeas corpus under Article 70 of New York law brought in front of her? I tell you, it's not very often. And of course, you go in front of a New York judge and the very first habeas corpus case they've ever seen is on behalf of a chimpanzee. <laughs> strange things can happen, and I assure you, I'll get to what strange things, strange things you know, did happen. Uh, but we're usually able to persuade the courts that indeed there is no, there is no um, res judicata or collateral estoppel. So that, that when, when we lose, and we, we were positive that we were going to lose, we're, and we don't know when we're going to start winning the whole thing, but, we, but we, we started to win pieces of this through our cases. But we understood that, that once we lost, we wanted to be able to see why we lost, sit back, see if we can fix it, and then file suit again. Now, of course, another great thing about the state of New York is there didn't, have, there didn't appear to be a venue provision. So we didn't have to go back to the same judge who had just thrown us out. We decided to move to another county. And that's, that's what we did. So every time we lost in one county, we then filed it again, tried to fix the problem, and we filed suit in another county. Which, of course, the Attorney General of New York didn't like that either. But the fact is, that's one of the real beauties of a common law writ of habeas corpus. Now, the writ of habeas corpus is, we view, really the, the, the key for being able to bring our substantive arguments you know, in, into court. So the question is, even if, if, if the court accepts that there's no venue, that you know, we, we have standing, uh, why should a court, why should a judge allow a chimpanzee to be released under a common law writ, writ of habeas corpus? What, what are the arguments? Uh, by the way, we also had one other problem that cropped up, uh, which, which um, was ironic. It was one of the potentially negative parts of the state of New York uh, in that um, there was, there was a, co a substantive common law of habeas corpus. But like almost every state, it was, it was implemented through a statutory procedure. So in, in, in Article 70 of the New York law, the only, the only entity who could seek a writ of habeas corpus would be a, quote, person, unquote. Now, we argued that since that was part of the procedural law, it did not affect the substance of the common law writ of habeas corpus, and it had to be, it, it, it had to be a person, since it was undefined, a person within the meaning of the common law, that according to the common law, the term was meant to be flexible. So, the writ of habeas corpus in New York was, did not replace the common law writ, which we're always very sensitive to. We don't want to go into a state where there is no common law writ. What it did, it does, is it regulates the procedure for using a common law writ of habeas corpus. Uh, and I think we've successfully persuaded the courts, of the uh, judges of the state of New York, that uh, that, that indeed is, is, is so. So, what are our, what are our legal arguments? Well, Again, look kind of combing through the values and principles of the judges as set out in their opinions, you know, for decades or even centuries, is that it's clear that th these judges value the idea of liberty and of equality. And you see it, you see it everywhere. And, and not only in the state of New York, you see it throughout the United States, you see it in other countries, you see it in international treaties. Liberty and equality keep coming back again and again as being something that, hey, everybody's for. In fact, if you go to the man or woman on the street, are you in favor of liberty? You favor of equality? Very few people say no. 
So at least in theory, liberty and equality, both on the, on the kind of general level and specifically on a legal level, seem to be values and principles that we all agree on. And so we looked at, the, that, at both of those very carefully in the state of New York. And so liberty, as I tell my students, is a, a liberty right is a kind of a non-comparative right. It's something that you're entitled to because of who you are or how you're put together without comparing you to someone else. Equality is a comparative right that you're entitled to because you're like somebody else you know, in a relevant way. And note that the problem of, of a, a um, precedent or formal common law judge trying to go back and say, how's my case like Pre previous cases, and it runs through the sieve of their values, and of, of their own personal values, when they're trying to make that decision. The exact same thing is going on when, they, when they're making a, a decision with respect to e equality. Because again, I'm like you, I'm, I'm like each of you in an infinite number of ways, and I'm unlike each of you in an infinite number of ways. And so when judges are trying to understand whether whether we're like each other, not just we're like each other, because we are like each other. I'm like an ant, too. I'm probably like a rose bush as well. And so I could make the argument that I should have the same rights as a rose bush, or the other way around, that the rose bush should have the same rights as I, uh, based on equality. It depends upon which of the characteristics that I and the rose bush, I and the, I and the chimpanzee, uh, or you and I share, which of those characteristics are the relevant characteristics as far as the court's concerned. And of course, that's the rub, and that, again, is where the judge's own values are the sieve that, that it kind of work, works its way through. And so, of course, the thing that we're always worried about is the judges are gonna look at a single characteristic, are you human? And that will be it. And, and that would be why we lose as a matter of equality, so we had to come up for, for reasons of how we might be able to avoid that. So the, it, it appeared that our reading of the state of New York that a liberty right was, was hitched to the idea of autonomy. That autonomy with, within the, 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 the courts of New York was a very, very powerful value. And one of the things that, that persuaded us was that the courts of the state of New York beginning in the 1980s were dealing with the problem of what happens if you have someone who's in a hospital who doesn't want to take drugs or have surgery that's, that's, gonna, be, that's gonna save their lives, and th they say, I don't wanna do it, I'd rather die. And the hospital goes in a court and says, this patient's gonna die unless you allow us to uh, give her surgery, you know, uh, make her undergo surgery, give her meds. And the courts had said, no, her autonomy trumps the interests of the state in her life. So you can't get much, a much more powerful value than that when it, when, when it trumps life. It trumps the state's interest in your life. Your autonomy is more important than your life. And so we say, okay. We agree with that, and we think that we, that, that we should fashion our arguments in terms of, of autonomy, and that's what we do. We begin to gather uh, affidavits from uh, the world's great chimpanzee cognition experts in Japan and Sweden and Germany and Scotland and England and, and the United States, and they're all addressed to all the different aspects of autonomy so that we can eventually put it all together and I think we end up uh, showing that, that there are like 42 different characteristics that, that certainly when you put them all together show that a, that, that a chimpanzee is autonomous. And we, file about, we end up filing about 100 pages of those. Of, of those. And so that's our liberty argument that there's autonomy we agree that autonomy is, is, is vital and an important value, but autonomy is found elsewhere than in human beings. And that in the non-human animal world, there is autonomy there too, and we can prove it. And we have proven it again and again and, and again, that chimpanzees are autonomous, as we're gonna show pretty soon that elephants are autonomous or orcas are autonomous. Uh, and 
one thing we always ensure that our argument is that autonomy is a sufficient characteristic for personhood and the fundamental right to body liberty, but we do not argue that it's a necessary characteristic. We don't argue that you must be autonomous in order to be a person, we, but we argue that if you are autonomous, then it's a slam dunk case. Then you, for sure, you should be a person with certain kinds of, of rights that protect that autonomy, which brings you back to habeas corpus, because that's really the purpose of habeas corpus is to protect your autonomy. So you're not going to be able to be held against your will somewhere, which, is a, a, which involves a destruction of your autonomy. So that's our liberty argument. Our, our equality argument was a little tougher because there's a lot of common law liberty cases out there. There's not so many common law equality cases out there. We think we've shown that it exists in, 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 in the state of New York, but here and elsewhere, once the 14th Amendment was passed, most common law litigation on, on equality stopped. And the litigation began under the 14th Amendment uh, equality. That, that became the issue. So the way we tried to kind of tie the constitutional arguments, and there are like you know, tens of thousands of cases involving the interpretation of the Equal Protection Clause in the 14th Amendment. The way we tied that to our common law was we cited an article by Chief Justice Kay uh, talking about the fact that there's been a, a constitutionalization to some degree of the common law. And so there's a two-way flow. The common law influences the way the Constitution might be interpreted and the Constitution interprets the, the way that common law equality might be interpreted. So, <coughs> excuse me, so first we decided to, to, to make that sort of argument. And then what kind of equality arguments, common law equality arguments, then can we make that will, uh, that will persuade the court? So, uh, you know, and where do we get them from? Because there are so few of them because it hasn't been litigated really since the, eight, the 1850s, eight, 1860s. So we used Chief Justice Kay's argument and began to reach into the 14th Amendment cases and to how they were, uh, how they were interpreting uh, the Equal, Equal Protection Clause. And so one of the things that, that we were m most interested was the idea of minimum rationale. In other words, if the, you know, there are certain things that the US Supreme Court and the other cases, they simply say that what you're doing violates equality because it's just irrational. And so we're interested in, in that because we argue that, that not, not giving a chimpanzee the equality to which she is due is irrational. So we look to how the minimum rationality test was constructed. And at, 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 its, very, at its very base, you have to show that you, that you have a reasonable means, a rational means to a legitimate end. So we don't argue with the court about what's rational or not. We, we focus in on the legitimate end. We then go back to our autonomy and say, it is not a legitimate end of the state to allow an autonomous being to be deprived of his personal liberty, his bodily liberty. That is not a legitimate end. And what legitimate end could it be? You can have all kinds of ends. Hey, non-human animal slavery is an end, just like human slavery was once an end. But we're arguing that's not a legitimate end. It's just an end. Because we've already proven that our chimpanzee or whatever non-human animal, that they are autonomous. Therefore, both as a matter, it, it's important both as a matter of liberty and as a matter of equality. Then we reached into the Romer case, which was a minimum rationale case with respect to whether um, Article Two of the... Um, Constitution of Colorado uh, could, could come in and essentially, depending upon how you read it, really strip gay people of virtually all of their rights in the state of Colorado. And so uh, Justice Kennedy said that it violated the very essence of equality uh, to choose a single characteristic and then strip someone of all of their rights because of that characteristic. There, it's because they're gay. For us, it's because they're not human. And We've already made the arguments that, that chimpanzees are extraordinarily cognitively complex, you know, in 42 different ways, uh, 100 pages of, of, of unchallenged affidavits, and we show that just simply picking that quality, and that indeed is a quality, but it's just, it's an arbitrary quality. So what? They're not human. Big deal. They're autonomous, and 
they are, and they have all of these other extraordinary cognitive abilities. Certainly, if they were human beings, there would be no doubt that they would be legal persons for the purpose of protecting their fundamental rights. So that is our liberty argument and our, our equality argument. Then we, you move to the issue, why do we pick chimpanzees? Well, we pick chimpanzees specifically because there is an immense amount of literature about them. They have been studied intensively, probably more than any other non-human animal, for 50 or 60 years. Certainly ever since Jane Goodall went to Gombe and kind of loosed this enormous amount of, of scientific research on the minds of chimpanzees. And so there's an enormous amount of scientific research, it's good scientific research. The scientific research also shows clearly that they are autonomous, they have all these extraordinary cog cognitive abilities. Simply, for example, to clear their conscious, they're self-conscious, they have a theory of mind, they understand that, uh, that there are other minds, they have a sense of I, they understand they've had a past, they understand they're in a the future, they understand that they're gonna be a present, they can, they can plan for the present. You know, they're clearly these very, very Com complex beings. So another thing is that there's not very many of them in the United States. And so their economic value is very low. And you know, the grand total of, every ch of all the chimpanzee economic value is, is almost certainly less than $100 million, probably a lot less than $100 million. So it's not, there, there's not an industry, a vast industry, like there were, say, if we decided to choose cows or chickens, there's not a vast industry that is dependent upon brutalizing you know, uh, those non-human animals of, of, uh, of doing everything, you know, of killing them, of, of, of harming them, of viewing them as things. There's not an industry that's worth hundreds of billions of dollars as there are for other non-human animals. So there's few of them. They're not, they're not indigenous to the United States. Um, every single one of them is essentially a captive so that's one of the reasons we, we chose chimpanzees. So now we have all of these, uh, all of these um, ideas are, we're put all together, and now we're ready to, to file our lawsuits. Once we find our chimpanzees, we chose certain kinds of certain chimpanzees named Merlin and Reba at a, at a sanctuary in Catskill. They both ended up um, dying to our shock. Uh, and then we, we saw once they died, that uh, it's very easy for chimpanzees to die here in the state of New York, probably anywhere. And we then looked for all the rest of the chimpanzees in the state of New York and decided to file suit on behalf of all of them essentially simultaneously. And so the first lawsuit that, that we filed in December 2013 was, was on behalf of Tommy. Uh, and we, we go into the Supreme Court in, in, in New York. The, the Supreme Court is, lowest, is the lowest court. And we don't know how real judges are actually going to deal with with us. We had a moot court. The judges that we brought in, some of them are sitting here. And, I mean, they were really tough. Um, so I thought I was ready for, for this. Um, and we, we were. Um, so we go in, and one judge, the first judge we run into, is so interested in this, he just brings us right out into the bench as, as we argue that he should issue, by the way, not a writ of habeas corpus, but New York allows you to also ask for what's an order, called an order to show cause. If you want the prisoner brought in, you seek a writ of habeas corpus. If you don't want the prisoner brought in, you seek an order to show cause. We did not want Tommy brought into a courtroom, uh, so we asked for an order to show cause. The judge is so interested in this that he, he doesn't read the two-foot stack of papers that we just filed. He just comes in and wings it. And so we knew he didn't read it because at one point, I say a fact, and he says, well, you have to have expert affidavits to back that. We said, yes, you know, from pages 100 to 200, those are expert affidavits. Uh, so he clearly likes our idea, and he says, well, what a great argument, but I'm not going to do this. So, but what he, what he does is he, he's interested in, in what we're doing. So the transcript, and we post everything we do, the transcript doesn't show everything that actually happened because he kept going off the record to give us advice as how to build a better record. And then we go on the record again and we do whatever, whatever he said. Uh, and so, so that, that was Tommy's case, but he said, you know, I'm, not, I'm just not gonna do this. And he didn't know why he wasn't gonna do it, but he knew he wasn't gonna do it. So we, you know, we understood that. 
uh, but we, we thought we'd been given a reasonably decent reception for, for the first time. So then we go to Niagara Falls and we do it again the following day. And we, we file suit on behalf of Kiko in Niagara Falls. And that judge, bless his heart, says he wants to have a chance to read what we gave him. And, he'll, and so he sets up a telephone argument in, in about a week. And he just lets me go on and on. And at the end, he just says, I'm not going to be the one to make this leap of faith. And we understood that. So we said thank you, and we're going to appeal that too. And then we fly over to Stony Brook, and we file a, our third lawsuit on behalf of Hercules and Leo. And that judge, I wouldn't know that judge if he ran me over. We never saw him. We just put the papers in, and they came out saying, get out of here. You lose. Uh, so we, we understood that we were, gonna, we, we were going to lose, but we didn't even think that we were going to get hearings. We thought, we, were, we thought that all the judges were going to act like the third judge did. Turns out the first two did not do that. So we then appealed Tommy's case, and in Tommy's case, if you see, if you see the film Unlocking the Cage, you get a little, a little hint of the chief judge there working me over. Uh, she was having a really good time. Um, and as, as I try to make arguments, she, she tells me she doesn't want to hear these arguments, move on to other arguments. Uh, and so the third department, what they actually did is they ruled against us saying that um, uh, in order to be a person, you have to be able to, be, to uh, bear duties and responsibilities. And we saw that coming in oral argument because she, you'll see in the film, she says, well, does, doesn't you know, don't you say that you have to be able to, that, that, that being a person involves duties and responsibilities. And my brain did not click in at that moment that she was thinking that you had to have the capacity, uh, you know, that you had to have, have the capacity both for rights and for duties and responsibilities. We were saying that once you're a person, you're open, you, can, you have the capacity for duties, and you have the capacity for rights and for, for duty for rights. But they're not necessarily linked. You don't, have to, you don't have to have, be able to bear duties in order to have rights, like witness you know, any three-year-old child, uh, or an, an insane person, or someone who is comatose. You, you, know, you can't eat them or experiment on them or whatever you want to do to a non-human animal. They have these rights, but they don't have any duties. So only when I later read their decision and went back to the transcript did I realize that without me real, truly understanding it in oral argument, that she was claiming that it was our idea to link uh, uh, the, uh, the capacity for rights with the requirement that you have duties and responsibilities. So we were, as you'll see in the film, you, 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 you can watch us as we as we open up the, the decision and go, you gotta be kidding me, basically. And uh, they, they appear to have not have recognized that there was a problem with children or with, with the insane or with other, other people who can have, when they're humans, who can have rights but no duties and responsibilities. So it looks like they're, so they, they throw in a footnote saying um, that this, of course, doesn't affect humans because humans collectively can bear duties and responsibilities, which we didn't understand then and we don't understand now exactly what they're talking about when, when, when you have duties and responsibilities collectively, what that means. Uh, you know, I have a right because you can bear duties. Uh, that doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense to us. It appeared to us to, to essentially be a speciesist way of trying to get rid of the case. And also, if you, if you accept that, the human beings can collectively have, be able to bear duties and responsibilities, well, why did you choose the species level? Why didn't you choose the, the genus level or the family level or the tribe level? Why? The great ape, we're all great apes, too. Great apes can, can both have rights and they can bear duties and responsibilities. Why? Because some, some of, of these folks can, some, some of the humans can. Uh, it wasn't, we, we didn't think it was really uh, thought out all that well, and we've been attacking it ever, ever since. Um, in fact, we're about to attack it in law review form and just deconstruct that paragraph uh, as to, as to what, what, they, what they were telling us, because we think every single word in it is essentially wrong. So we then moved on to the, um, to, well, to the second department where, where we, um, where we, had appealed Hercules and Leo, 
failure to be able to get an order to show cause. So then we file an appeal there. Actually, this, this occurred before Tommy's case. And we file a motion to admit me pro hoc vicee to make the argument in the second department. And we get back an unusual decision, which is that, no, we deny your motion to, uh, to appear pro hoc vicee on the grounds that we sua sponte dismissed your appeal. And without briefing or anything, just we, we have dismissed it because you don't have the right to appeal. Well, we knew darn well that we had the right to appeal. That's one of the reasons we chose the state of New York. In fact, the statute says you have a right to appeal. It specifically does. So we, filed, we figured, oh, we're just going to file a motion to reconsider and like direct them to the statute that says you have a right to appeal. They just said denied, and that was the end of the second department. Uh, so we decide rather than appealing it to the Court of Appeals, we're just going to refile it some other place out of the second department. So uh, then we go to, uh, so we've now lost, uh, first we lost because we can't appeal in the second department. In the third department, they say you can appeal, but you lose because you, because uh, in order to be a person, you have to be able to be able to bear duties and responsibilities collectively. And then we go to the fourth department, and they obviously don't like either what the second or third department does, because they then have us lose on yet a third ground, and without citing the fact that we've lost on any of the other two grounds. So what they say is, you can't use a writ of habeas corpus at all. And why is that? Well, because you can only use a writ of habeas corpus to free someone absolutely. You know, we did not ask that Kiko, that, uh, Kiko be let loose in Times Square. What we did is we asked that Kiko go to the spectacular sanctuary, say, say the chimps, where you have an artificial lake and 13 islands, and there are five acres, and there are two dozen chimpanzees lived on them. It's a terrific sanctuary. You know, if I was a chimpanzee, I would want to be there. So. Meanwhile, Kiko is being kept in a cage. But the judges make that equation. All you're doing is moving Kiko from one place of captivity to another place of captivity, and you're not, so you can't use the writ of habeas corpus for that. You know, I want to tell the judges, well, judges, aren't we all captive? Uh, I mean, I want to go to Mars, but I can't get there. I, I, so we don't think that that decision you know, really makes a whole lot of sense, and it makes even less sense, because if you look at our transcript, the issue came up in oral argument. Well, don't you, ha you can't move from one place of captivity to another place, another place of captivity. And what I, I did, I just started reeling off cases in which, indeed, the writ of habeas corpus had been used to move uh, human beings from one place to another place. The, the kind of a classic case being, you had a father who had Alzheimer's disease, and the daughter was keeping him. So the mother files a writ of habeas corpus saying, I want my husband. And the court says, you get the husband. Now, I'm going to issue a writ of habeas corpus, and the husband moves from the daughter to you, from the daughter's apartment to the wife's apartment. And we cited so many cases, because I was ready for that question, you know, bang, 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 that one of the judges sitting right over there, number four across from the right, so she says, okay, okay, we get it. <laughs> and then I opened up the decision, and they didn't get it, or they did get it, but decided to do that anyway. So we decide that uh, things had not worked out for various strange reasons in the second, third, and fourth department. We go to the first department in Manhattan. And that's where we ran into Justice Barbara Jaffe, who issued the writ of habeas corpus in April of, of 2015. So for the first time, a, a, a writ of habeas corpus in order to show cause was issued for a non-human non animal. And this is where, you can, and one of the downsides of having somebody, a film team follow you around, is that when you screw up, they're right there. So this is my major screw up, which is I got so excited about that, and so did everyone else in Non-Human Rights Project, that we issued a press release saying that the judge had implicitly recognized the personhood of Hercules and Leo by issuing the habeas corpus in order to show cause. This is and now another thing happened I'd never seen before. The judge has her lawyer send us an email saying, no, I didn't. And I go, oh, and so you can see me on film going, oh man, um, you know what? She's right. We in fact, on page one, I go back to page one of our petition, 
where we say, if you issue the writ of habeas corpus, that doesn't mean you recognize the chimpanzee as a person. So I, we thought, oh, the judge is going to think we, you know, we sandbagged her. And uh, you know, we felt terrible about it. And so we issued something else. But anyway, we had the hearing. And you, it, a lot of it's, or some of it's on film. And you can watch what happens. This judge, at one point, I th we think we may have won. But we lose on another technicality. Uh, we win on virtually everything else. When, when the argument about venue comes, we win. When the Attorney General throws us, tries to throw us out on grounds of standing, we win. So for the first time, you had a non, you had a human entity given standing when they never even alleged that they were injured, but they did it on behalf of, of a non-human animal. So for us, we've been building on that. So the Non-Human Rights Project is now moving along. We're, we're still moving along through our appeals. Um, I won't even, don't have the time to tell you about the other strange things that continually happen uh, to us in there, and we're trying to figure out how we deal with them. But we're about to file suit on behalf of elephants in a traveling circus in a second state. We're looking at another case involving chimpanzees in a third state. And we've also just brought in a, um, a can we're bringing in a campaigns director. We're also bringing in a uh, director of public policy and government relations. We spent a lot of time researching the issue of whether or not um, a, a municipality can make a non-human animal legal person within the boundaries. And we believe that there are 14 states who have so-called constitutional home rule provisions that you can do that. So we're now looking at cities and towns throughout those 14 states, especially ones that we intend to move into in litigation, and try to begin getting those kinds of ordinances passed in those cities and towns, both to try to do it, but also to just to try to get the issue in those cities and towns begin to be talked about a lot uh, in that state before we come in. Because we do sympathize with, with the judges of New York. All of a sudden, we come out of nowhere, we parachute in the state of New York demanding habeas corpus you know, rights for chimpanzee. And so they weren't ready for it. We're hoping as we move into other states that they will be more ready for us. And the last thing I, I have time to tell you is that uh, as you'll see in, in the film, it, we get the idea that some of the judges might be implicitly biased against us. Uh, so we've actually are beginning to work with Project Implicit at, at Harvard to uh, run a series of, uh, of studies uh, which we think are going to show that not only the judges, but probably everybody in the room, including myself, are biased against what we're doing. And that, but on an implicit level, uh, which to my astonishment came up in the, in the debate between Trump and Clinton. The, Implicit bias, we, we've been working on that, and so we, we think that, that, that the results are likely going to be that way because we all grew up in a, in a culture that feels that way, that's, that's biased against the ideas of a non-human animal being a legal person. And when we get that data, assuming we do, we're then gonna very carefully raise it in front of the court saying, we think you're implicitly biased, all of you, and that we're not moving to recuse you because we don't think we can, but we would like to have you take that into consideration when you're deciding our case, that you're implicitly biased against us. <laughs> so uh, I think now I will stop, and uh, I'd like to have any, any sorts of questions you might have or comments to, let's go. Thank you. Well, okay, as usual, I'm either completely opaque or very clear. <laughs> oh, sorry. I, I just can't see, so just start talking. <laughs> yes. <coughs> okay, I'm Michelle Inman. I'm from the Oklahoma City University Law School on the 2L. Yes. And uh, I come to law school for precisely this very reason is to um, help animals um, become considered persons, but until then to try and get the anti cruelty laws that we already have on the books to uh, be enforced. So, my question is that <sighs> it's going to sound um, a little bit weird, but you know, we eat animals. And so it's going to be really hard to overcome that hump with 99% of the population of the animals and then try to consider them as being, having rights as persons. But until we can get to that point, um, what can we do 
to at least get the anti-cruelty statutes on the books that we have right now, because Oklahoma has an anti-cruelty statute and it, it covers any animal, any animal. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't differentiate between a farm animal, a livestock, mm -hmm. a pet, any, any animal. Um, and right now, in my view, it's a criminal statute and the ADA or the Attorney General isn't prosecuting anyone against that necessarily, especially when it comes to farm animals on slaughterhouses or you know, right. you know, factory farms. So what can we do to, you know, at least in the meantime, while you're working on that end, to establish this personhood, which I think is going to be a long, long road to travel, what can we do now? Because we do have anti-cruelty statutes on the books. These guys are not, you know, abiding by the law That's... and the law of their practices and procedures. Well, I, I think you put your finger on the problem. That's why the Non-Human Rights Project exists, is that uh, when, if you can imagine, if, if the government took all of your rights away and said, what we're gonna do is, saying, uh, is say, uh, humans, you can't be cruel to humans, and I hope that's okay, uh, you would not feel that your fundamental interests were protected, and by the way, if they are cruel, there's nothing you can do about it, but you can go to the DA who might or might not decide to prosecute. And you know, th that's, that is the problem. And so you, you, all you can do is have, uh, is have the, you know, keep pushing, keep trying to use the political process, because you don't have a choice. Go through the legislature and try to get them to tighten up, up their statutes, their enforcement. We think that that ultimately is not the way to go, because, because this problem is never going to go away. It's never going to go away. Those who are, you know, who have interests, financial interests, especially in the exploitation of non-human animals, are not ever going to give up. They, they never do. Masters never give up their slaves without a fight. And so all you can do is do your, do your best. And I'm not the person to ask how best to do that because we don't do that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what we do is try, to, is try to say, this paradigm, you know, has to be changed. Right. And, uh, and so we're looking in the, you know, further down the road trying to change it not only here in, 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 in the United States, but throughout the world. In fact, one of the things we're also doing is you know, we're working right now with, uh, with legal groups in, um, in uh, England, Switzerland, France, Spain, Portugal, Australia, Argentina, you know, trying, because when I talked about it, that the animals being in a republic of suffering, they are all over the world. The animals don't care which side of the state line they're on, which side of the national border they're on. They're all being horribly exploited, and it, and it has to be not only a local, but a national, but an international effort. And all you can do is the best you can, and that'll be enough to get you into heaven, I promise you. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Beth Hansen from BYU Hi. Law School, Career Services Office. So, um, if I remember from law school, corporations are people. Persons. Persons. Is that case? Stephen Colbert says they're people. But yeah, okay. <laughs> and I think Mitt Romney said and they Mitt Romney people. says it too. <laughs> Does that case have any bearing or is it useful in this argument at all to say you've got this non-living, almost imaginary, right, entity that is a person for purposes of protection? These are living creatures. I think it. I think it does help. You know, we, we certainly don't fail to remind courts that that um, that corporations are 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 also persons. Uh, there's all kinds of arguments against it, um, uh, but we also argue, for example, that uh, you know, we we talk about some of our sister common law countries in India, uh, in pre-independence India, Hindu idol was a person. A uh, mosque was a person. In 2000, the Supreme Court of India said that the holy books of the Sikh religion is a person. And New Zealand, bless its heart, has been going crazy. Uh, in la see, in six years ago, they said the Wanganui River was a person. And earlier this year, they said a national park was a person. So that's why I've been to New Zealand twice to try to say, let's get moving here. Uh, uh, and, and so the, the, who is a person is a is a policy and principle kind of decision. Mm -hmm. It's not a taxonomic or biological issue. Uh, you know, a person, a human is, all humans are now persons, but clearly all persons are not humans. And for a long time, all humans weren't persons either. And so many judges, though, don't seem to grasp that uh, all that well. And we're hoping that they do grasp it. Justice Jaffe certainly did. Um, 
And I, I think it's going to take them a while to start, to start thinking about this. Because after all, most of the persons you run into are, are human beings. But it's not necessarily so. And we're trying to, you know, we're trying to, that's why we make our arguments as a matter of public policy and legal and moral, moral principle. That, that person should be logically and, and uh, as a matter of principle and policy extended at least to such non-human animals as chimpanzees. At least that's where we begin. Thank Thanks. you. Hi. Hello. It's great to see you. And How are you? you? Nice to see I'm you swell. again. Thanks. Thanks. You too. Um, so it's great to get an update on on what you're doing, <laughs> and I'm wondering if um, so. The implicit bias work w with the Harvard Project sounds awesome, and the um, you said you're looking at municipalities where they may be able to declare non-humans persons. Yes. Is that a shift in strategy towards legislation or? Uh, Perceptive. Um, it's not so much a shift in strategy as it's, 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 it, it's a matter of manpower and money, we, which we had none of either really for a, a long time. And now as more money starts coming in, we're able to, to fill in the holes that, that we had. We, we think that it's gonna require you know, fights from, from all sides. Um, but we started working on the Home Rule, um, the Home Rule Law Review article, I'm embarrassed to say, seven years ago. Uh, but it's finally getting printed in Syracuse Law Review, I think in, in October. And where we, we think that we, we're not gonna start at the state level yet, we wanna go as into municipalities and think that they can indeed make a non-human animal a person. So, and that and that, that will, you know, that, that sort of thing, plus the litigation, we hope are, will begin to work in a synergy, both w with respect to state houses <coughs> and ultimately the U.S. Congress. Ultimately. Um, and one of the things that we've been doing <coughs> is that uh, we admire, as so many other people do, admire the progress made in gay marriage in, up, up to the 14th Amendment. And so um, Evan Wolfson, who, who runs Freedom to Marry, has been advising us for the last year and a half, so we've been trying to suck out every piece of knowledge he has about how he did it, how they did it, so that we can understand how we can better uh, hone our strategy and, and tactics. And, and uh, you know, they, they, they were extraordinary, and we're hoping to be able to understand how we can be extraordinary, too. You're pretty extraordinary. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Paige Eichelman. I am a non-lawyer, but I have a background in biodiversity conservation and management and uh, veterinary medicine. And so <clears throat> you kind of touched on this when you were referring to the chimpanzee and uh, granting it autonomy and rights, not letting it loose in Times Square. So my question goes to how will the establishment of uh, personhood and mm -hmm. rights for non-human animals affect our quote-unquote ownership or guardianship of particularly domesticated species such as dogs and equines that have 10,000 years of domestication and really are not suited to be autonomous in a wild setting anymore. And so that, that was my question is how will you, how do you foresee this law uh, that you're working toward affecting domesticated animals versus we, wild? We, we really don't know. Right, right now we're trying to you know, break through this wall so that at least a, a one non-human non animal has a, a legal right so that, that it, it's possible to, to do so. Mm -hmm. um, once we do that, we think it's likely to catalyze a response at lots of levels. Be, probably be half a dozen states will immediately pass statutes saying in this in this state, uh, you know, a, uh, no non-human animal can, can ever be a person. We we look at the gay marriage model mm -hmm. and as as being not a bad a bad one. So one of the reasons that we chose chimpanzees is that they're not like that. Um, domestic. Sometimes people try to undermine my arguments by noting, as you see in the film, my little dog running beside me, mm -hmm. like I'm mm -hmm. I'm the master of my slave dog, um, <laughs> and I say, you watch what happens when I open the side door and put him out in the back, I say, bye, he, just, he runs in before I can, uh, you know, before I can close it. Uh, uh, we have, I think, a different sort of duty to domesticated animals, right. but we have a duty 
to act in their interests, not a duty that we, you know, we, 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 sh we should be barred from exploiting them. Uh, but we've domesticated them. We now have a duty to act in their interests. How that is going to work out, I have not a clue. Uh, all we're trying to do is really kick the door open, uh, and just like people did in, when they passed, the, you know, say the 14th Amendment, uh, you just kind of passed it, and all of a sudden, it was going to take a lot of a lot of cases to begin mm -hmm. to flesh out what what's going on here. And it, and at that point, it won't be the Non-Human Rights Project. There'll be all kinds of organizations and people are going to be filing their own cases, and uh, um, we just have to stand back and see what happens mm -hmm. along with everybody else as we're doing our own our own work. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Brittany Cardoza, and I'm an undergraduate at The Ohio State University. I intend on going to law school to practice animal law. And my question is, as you move from chimpanzees and hopefully are successful and move into elephants and maybe orcas and other autonomous animals that we do have more of an economic interest in, like, how do you anticipate new challenges coming from zoos and other corporations that have an interest in keeping them not persons? Oh, yes. We're sure certainly going to run into <laughs> yeah. that. Um, at first, our feelings were hurt in that they were ignoring us. Uh, <laughs> but now, we are reading, you know, in ag magazines, other people saying, you know, hey, they're coming after us next. And we say, wah? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Stacey Garfinkel. Thank you for speaking here today. Um, so my question pertains to sort of in recent years, we've seen courts increasingly awarding money, let's say if a dog or a cat is injured, not just as property, but also recognizing sort of the emotional impact it's having on families that have lost these animals mm -hmm. um, and sort of those issues. And I'm wondering, as courts start to recognize them in, in those ways and award money based on that sort of loss of companionship, if you feel that that will help this movement and also will help in terms of making judges and courts feel more comfortable about recognizing animals as persons once we move beyond sort of we're acknowledging that they're not just property, they do have some other value. I'm not, I, I really don't think so. Uh, one, one of the statements I sometimes make is that, you know, more welfare doesn't equal rights. That they're, they're different mindsets, they're different gestalts, they have different histories. Uh, I, 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 think, I think not, um, uh, except in, in, a, in a very abstract, general way in, in that uh, it might get judges used to seeing non-human non animals uh, or thinking about them in some kind of a different way. But even in those cases, you're really not giving damages to the non-human animal, you're giving damages to the human being based upon you know, her relationship with the non-human animal. Even that doesn't happen very much. So I would encourage people to continue doing that. It certainly doesn't have any downside I, I, I can think of, but I don't see it except in only a very secondary way as advancing the idea that, 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 that your dog could be, could be a person in her own right. Thank you. I think I'm I think I'm done. Thanks again. <laughs> <laughs>